Hey, good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be up at nine o'clock and ready to go and seeing all of you here so uh, busily talking to each other, which over my years of uh, being here in Denver on various projects, you are a wonderful community that spends a lot of time commuting with each other, well, I could say competing, but consulting with each other, and that's the way you get things done, and that's why I am so excited to be here today. So I'm Marilyn Jordan-Taylor. I'm an architect and urban designer. Uh, I also am a ULI longtime full member, uh, and I was very fortunate to be chosen a couple of decades ago to be the first woman global chair of ULI. And I really truly did it because of my friends like Mary Lee Utter and others of you here, because it's, it, it, was the, it was the right thing to do and a wonderful thing. And we're still, we're still looking for members and we're still expanding all the way around the world. And if anybody wants to uh, love this so much, uh, you can speak to Lauren or Barbara and we'll be glad to sign you up. Oh, and Rodney. Does everybody know Rodney? Why don't you just stand up and say hello? So uh, a few quick slides about the Urban Land Institute. Uh, we are a mission. We are, we are an advocacy group. We're not a lobbying group. We are a 501c3 research institution. Our mission is to shape the future of the built environment for transformative impact in communities worldwide. So we're right on the spot with, the, the, with what you are trying to do here. There are about 45 members, uh, 45,000 members all around the world. Uh, and what we do is we conduct research, we provide forums for sharing and exploring, we write, we publish, we organize and conduct meetings, we direct outreach programs and da 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 da, our favorite, we conduct advisory service panels. It is a, I think I have to do this, don't I? Um, it is a time-tested program, a five-day process that has been honed for many, many years. I think it was back in 1947-48 when this uh, first began as something we really felt we did for ourselves, but we also did for our communities, elevate their expectations. So what we do is we follow a strict five day and five element process. We arrive having gotten a sponsor briefing and we get together and ask questions and exchange ideas based on our understanding of that brief. And we also have a time to mix and get to understand each other and how we're gonna work together. Then we, even if it's hundred degrees outside, then we have a site tour. Uh, and most of all, and so thank you for those of you in the room who actually participated in this or came in even in other forms, uh, we have a day full of stakeover interviews. And this year, I think between the various meetings we had and that long day of interviews, we spoke to more than a hundred of you and your colleagues. And we really, really uh, learned a lot from that process. Um, then the panel goes to work, which means uh, we get in a room somewhere and we all plug in and we begin doing the work that needs to be done. Um, we, we work together, we work individually. Uh, the panelists are handpicked so that they bring the kind of expertise that your specific brief is asking for. And we hope that then through those next three, two days of work, we can actually come together with uh, ideas I, and concepts, and here, then we are here today. So we're gonna spend uh, uh, a, a, a about 45 minutes in presentation, but please remember, get your questions, your comments ready, because that's really where the heart of this presentation should be leading us. Uh, I do wanna say thank you to uh, uh, the, um, Advisory Service Panel Sponsors, City and County of Denver, Auraria Higher Education Campus, uh, CU Denver, Downtown Partnership, and also acknowledge the contribution from the JBG Foundation. Um, I, I, I'll hold this up for you because it's just the start of it. This is the 100 plus, 
And if you don't see your name on here, you, you can add it if you'd like, but we will know that you have been there because uh, it's just so important to us. And so rather than starting right off with what we want to present to you, I would like to offer a little bit of the feedback, can't quote everybody for their contributions, but a little bit of the feedback um, that we uh, gleaned and investigated during, the, during our interview day. So the idea of a living urban campus, it's not its own compound, it's integrated into the city. This is very much in the direction where education is going, where workforce uh, learning is going, and, when, and where people will, especially even more over the next two decades, I believe, uh, continue, to, uh, continue to advance their education through the means that's most valuable in order for you to get the skill and the outcome that you're looking for. Um, this is great. Leave a 21st century legacy. Leave something. Compete on the global stage. Cherry Creek is a jewel, but Cherry Creek is dangerous. I work next to Spear Boulevard, but I've never crossed it. That's a good one, isn't it? Uh, the Cherry Creek Corridor is a, is a valuable but under-leveraged asset that must be capitalized on. Green spaces must yield, yield multiple community benefits, economic development, green infrastructure, resilience, uh, progress in equity, and, uh, and in all of the other ways of community building. High quality parks and green spaces are critical to the future of downtown. Chance for Dave, Dave, Denver to do something special with Cherry Creek. Use water to bring people together, be bold. So those are excerpted quotes. I'd like to introduce the panel now. Um, I'm the panel chair. Um, I'm a professor of architecture and urbanism after 40, 40 years of practice uh, and uh, a professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Um, I would like that now though to uh, have the other members of the panel come up and introduce themselves. And uh, I'm gonna think maybe do it in the order in which we're presenting. So we'll do it, we'll do it when we do our presentations. No, no, you. Um, I thought that's what we were doing. Okay. I think you missed this conversation but we, because okay. they, everybody said they wanted, the others said they wanted to come up and introduce themselves. So come right. up Whatever works. and introduce yourself. Duke is a long time ULI person as well. We worked together on the university, in the starting up of the university and in innovation uh, um, product council. And uh, Duke was its leader for quite some time and still is a member. I jumped over and I started doing place making. So. And make no doubt, Marilyn's the boss. So she says, get up here and do your uh, introduction. I'm doing the introduction, right? I have so little power. So uh, Duke Ryder, I'm a senior advisor to the president, Arizona State University, former dean of the College of Design. I run something called the University City Exchange, which is why I'm here today. We're all about that intersection and how both sides can prosper. Thank help. you, Yvonne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne Young. I am the CEO of SDG Strategy, so stand for Sustainable Development Goals. I'm from the Toronto District Council Advisory Board and also a vice chair of SDLC Board of Council. So if you are going to ULI uh, for a meeting in Dallas, I'm gonna see you there. Thank you. Ross. Good morning, I'm Ross Tillman. I'm a transportation planner with my own practice in Seattle. I work frequently with parks, arenas, stadia, recreation, major event districts, uh, helping them solve their circulation transportation needs. Um, I was previously on the Seattle Design Commission where I had the luxury of reviewing major public projects like the sort you're contemplating, uh, advocating for urban design excellence. And I'm something of a panel junkie. Thank you. Brian? Ross is being modest. I think this is what, 26? Your 26th panel? So he's an expert. 
Uh, good morning. My name is Ryan Cambridge. I'm a landscape architect. Uh, I have my own private practice in Indianapolis, Indiana. I've spent the last 15 years or so helping both uh, the private sector, or excuse me, working in the private sector and the nonprofit sector, uh, primarily to help uh, different municipalities leverage the multifaceted benefits of their parks and open space systems. So everything from really large scale big ideas down to very small interventions. So very excited. Thank you. And I will speak for Kelly Nagel who at the last minute was not able to be here. We usually require all the panelists to be here at every moment, every midnight, every 6 a.m. But um, what we also do, and it should be evident, I hope as we move forward, that we just don't grab five or six people. We really search in the ranks of ULI to see the four, five, six people who really can bring their specific uh, uh, expertise and excitement to the panel. And in this case, Kelly Nagel is the founding and managing partner of her investment uh, in, in housing and development. She's in Washington, DC. She will be joining us over Zoom as we move along through this process. And I'm also proud to say she is now the, uh, the uh, chair of the Women's Leadership Initiative in ULI as well. So uh, for those of you, uh, and especially the younger ones of you, uh, the um, ULI is a great place to extend your network hyperbolically compared to almost any other thing that you can put your mind uh, to think to. Okay, so right now um, I'm just gonna quickly, this is not really the agenda of the program, but really um, a very short synopsis of where we think this is going. As we read through the brief and did our interviews and met with the key sponsors, we began to feel that it was very important in the context of the economy to, to think first about vision and then come back into the details of what can we do now to move through this time and, and kickstart the opening up possibilities for what you all want to do in the future. So here, here are some of those ideas. Embrace the importance of the role of education to Denver's future economy, workforce, identity, and commitment to equity. Integrate the Aurora campus and the downtown. Both should become mixed use districts that connect with each other easily. Create mixed use communities with a priority to affordable housing, transit oriented development and innovation partners. Now, think about now, action. Initiate the change now, maybe with pilots, maybe with tests. Prioritize inclusion of indigenous peoples and displaced residents and businesses. Kickstart enhanced safety and connectivity by reconfiguration of the Spear Boulevard. Optimize cross connections between Auraria and downtown. And finally, but in some ways to me, most important, revitalize Cherry Creek for the benefit of Denver's communities and for its ability to connect all of the neighborhoods and places we've been talking about. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Duke. I have a couple slides in there. I just want to push. The boss tried to take the clicker. All right. Um, I'm not much of a podium person, so I'm going to do this. So I'm gonna to try to get this off to uh, a start to set the stage for what you're gonna hear from my colleagues who are gonna give you much more detailed ideas about the place. But to begin with, uh, I want you to know, and it should be pretty obvious, I did, uh, Laura gave a great presentation that talked about office vacancies and changing workplaces, et cetera, et cetera. That's a national phenomenon. That's not a Denver issue, that's national. And uh, you should know that. You probably have the greatest opportunity to advance beyond the current state than almost any other city. The same disruptions that you're seeing in the urban core are happening in higher ed. Sometimes they're even related. Housing's expensive downtown. Housing's difficult for students. Workers aren't coming to the office because they can uh, do their work from home. Students aren't coming to the campus because they can stay home and get their class there. We're seeing the same thing, same challenges in many ways, and they're related. These are two big issues. This might be one of the great connectors between the two. It will not be the case that you go to college 
at 18, graduated 21, you're done. You got what you need to know. You persist in your career for the rest of your life. Won't happen. You'll be going to school to get educated at times over your life. And on the campus that you have here, you have the full spectrum of offerings with regard to education. That's a great asset. You're also positioning yourself really well. Uh, this happens to be something about CU. If you look at this chart, on the bottom, Pell Grants are telling you about students that are in need. And the chart also tells you those students who are in need struggle to graduate over six years. Those who've always had means do pretty well. But you all have identified that, your student body, what its shape is, very much like Arizona State University. And you're looking forward to remedy that. So for example, putting your efforts into a great engineering program, a building to accommodate that. If you look at this chart, which talks about job satisfaction or engagement or persistence in that career, uh, you'll see that engineering is moving to the upper right-hand side of the chart and that's where you're positioning yourself. That's a fantastic strategic move. Eco, eco, excuse me, education ecosystem. Let's talk about that. You are doing the opposite of what I was involved in at Arizona State University 15, almost 20 years ago. On the right-hand side of the screen is a classic university campus. You can see the edge of it. It's very clearly defined. Big buildings, trees and sidewalks in between, you know when you're on campus. When we decided to establish a campus in downtown Phoenix, then the sixth largest, now the fifth largest city in the United States, we moved whole colleges in their entirety with the intent that you would not be able to find the edge of the campus. So we were moving from a conventional campus to an urban setting, something we had never done before. You've actually got a quality urban downtown, which Phoenix didn't have at the time. And now you're trying to take over a campus and integrate the city into that. That exchange is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. These are some of the big drivers of what's happening here. Of course, downtown, moving it forward, rejuvenating it, uh, creating something on the campus that's attractive so that you would cross beer. Uh, I remember talking to the person who said she lived near uh, uh, Spear and never crossed it. I can understand why. It's quite a distance, as Ross will talk about. Uh, and new development, of course, with the River Mile, the ball area. There's a lot going on here. You've got three powerful institutions on one campus and they all have separate agendas. They should pursue those separate agendas. They have to, that's their mission. That's how they're judged. On the other hand, as they're trying to do, and they all have great and re recently installed leaders, they can do a lot of things together. So the advantage of being an outsider is you can make some assumptions that it could be this way or probably is this way. And you all know why it either is or isn't. I'm ignoring that. I'm just suggesting, seems like this might be a possibility. So you've got three people in the family, so to speak, and that's the house. And the house is very well taken care of, let's say, by AHAC who provides the services for those folks to do well, uh, takes care of the resource as the landlord, as the person who's operating that place. But what if you looked at that campus and said, what's its real value? I'm talking about in monetary terms that in turn can be translated into resources for one purpose, great education for students and their success. So how do you take an asset that you have and you have it, whether it's owned by the state or not, I understand that complication, but you can work with that. How do you turn it into something more? And why would you wanna do that? Well, it's been a lot of talk about innovation districts, which are defined by everyone, no matter where they are slightly differently but they probably have these food, three food groups affiliated with them. And so if you look at that building on the left, that building was built in a way that came through this process. Phoenix turns to ASU and said, we'll give you seven acres, but you have to develop it at a rapid pace. We then turned to a private developer and said, would you like to help us build this? That's Wexford Science Technology. That building's up and running with us in it. It's fantastic. There's the interior lobby. It's become the hub of another innovation district that we've started about around biomedical technology. But look at these numbers and who's playing what role. Everybody has to be entrepreneurial in their thinking, whether you're building a spec lab building, we're now gonna build two more because it's been so successful. Whether we build buildings dedicated to uh, uh, high-tech education 
And in every one of these cases, the municipalities are contributing tens of millions of dollars to get us there because they're getting such a good return on their investment. And we have two real estate arms in our university. Or we even build senior housing on that Tempe campus. Remember our Tempe campus? We now have seniors living in a 20-story building on campus. We're getting an incredible return on that investment financially, but also they're mentoring students. Students are in the building serving them. It's all working out extremely well. Kelly offered some thoughts, and she'll be on the screen in just a few minutes, about how you might think about the advantages of working with developers, with REITs, with uh, financiers, all kinds of situations to advance your agenda. And uh, I'm not going to read all the slides, as you can tell, but uh, there is so much more, it would seem to me, that you could do in an entrepreneurial fashion. I'll conclude my remarks by saying, this is all process. You should also have some things that signal that you're moving forward. Um, and uh, Andrew, I saw in the audience somewhere in the back there, I think we all understand, there he is waving his hand. Andrew's an enthusiast for all this, by the way, I can tell. Uh, you know, this is a critical intersection, Larimer and, and, and Spear. You've already identified that. Um, Lar as I walk from downtown to the campus, and the reason why maybe a lot of people don't, I'm not sure why I'm going over there, what am I going to do? But it also, it's not always very pleasant. Uh, what you see in the middle here is some of the many solar installations we build on our campuses. We're generating 70, 75 megawatts of power, but that's almost incidental. The civic life underneath them is profound. Sometimes we work with the city. This is a piece of public art in downtown by Janet Eckelman as part of their public art program. Put out some signals that something new and interesting and different, maybe even a little strange and fascinating is happening. So how could that Larimer access move into the campus? That's our Skysong uh, uh, real estate uh, program having to do with, uh, again, ed tech. We invested our money in a giant shade structure, but it does more than that. It's the signal that we're in town, we're doing business and we're doing it differently. So I think you should think uh, very big at large scale about what could happen at that intersection. Thank you very much. Now I'm gonna turn over my friend Yvonne. So the question is how to make this happen. What we want to present to you is a framework for action leading by public realm and public spaces, and also build upon the legacy of the Denver core area, the vibrant mixed uses and creating urban spaces for this new 150 acre and transforming that into a mixed use community. The broader strategy is that using this to kickstart a series of capital investment projects so that it can put Denver on the global stage. So we know that the Aurora is the largest collective college campus in Colorado. And it is also within walking distance to downtown served by free light rail transit station. And this is very significant. We know that the university is going through a shift from a commuter campus to a living urban campus. So we see there is a unique opportunity to leverage on this to extend the downtown mixed use legacy to this area, create 15 minute walkable neighborhood as the competitive advantage and using this as a model to position not just the campus but Denver as a leader in sustainable city building for the 21st century. This is the view of the campus from the South. We see it is a Coflex on the uh, uh, southerly east-west connection and Spear Boulevard and, and a north-south connection. What's interesting and it's also very obvious is that 80% of the 150 acre is within five minute walk from existing LRT station that you already have tra uh, trains arriving every three minutes. And we know that the development industry, the investor, they're looking for these kind of convenience when they're selecting location as their choice, the top choice to relocate, whether it's for business partnership or for redevelopment. So the key to unlock this is that turning these circles into complete high density mixed use neighborhood. So what's critical to the success is that early on, thinking about orchestrating a variety of vibrant mixed uses on the ground floor not just focusing on providing restaurants and office and retail users, but also providing what is the there to there. So those are the cultural spaces that's authentic about the area. Those are the community spaces that you can very quickly draw and making that into a local destination and starting to blur the line between this 150 acre and the surrounding area. 
So another key element as a key action item is that we're very excited that we know the campus will be looking at uh, doing a master plan. But what is the key to the success as a first step is to start thinking about orchestrating the public realm plan. So this is about extending the downtown fine green streets and mixed use block into the campus, which already been successful on the other side of uh, Sphere Boulevard and develop a public realm plan, particularly focusing on two mechanism. One is to transform these uh, yellow area into main streets. Another one is to transform these yellow patch area into urban spaces. So when people are associating with these spaces, they don't need to remember the name of the street, but it's really about where is the places that I want to go. So um, one of the key uh, input we heard from stakeholder is that notwithstanding on the map, you have all these infrastructures already in place, but the experience is not there. We see there's a lot of land that is available, but those are underutilized. They're A, either uh, getting taken over by vehicular traffic, so there's a redundancy of those uh, infrastructure, and also there is a lack of programmable space. So that will be our key focus. We also see surrounding the 150 acre is not a void, is not a hole because you have the existing community. In fact, on the campus, you have two primary school within the campus. So what we see as, a, as a, another top priority and also one of the low hanging fruit is that show some of the improvement that making this as a model of how you can bring the kids and the families into the campus in the most convenient way, making walking, cycling as a top choice. Because of the climate in here, investing in green infrastructure, not just to deal with flooding, but dealing with the heat is paramount. Another element that we see is that there's tremendous assets already on the campus. So through our interview, we heard from stakeholders that they, they do want to optimize these as the local destination, how to use it to attract the community onto the campus. So the blue dotted area, they're showing some of the uh, existing infrastructure, whether they're the new wellness center that's already funding onto Spear Boulevard, the Tiffany that has a long history, the place of worship and the primary school that I was talking about. So one of the key things that we learned is that what is fundamental is to create the ecosystem of a competitive workforce starting with H0. So this is looking at an, a very quick opportunity to really think about from a programming standpoint, how you can optimize your existing asset, but is to provide uh, intentional uh, inclusion in terms of program area. So this is showing as an opportunity, it's not just for the academic, academic users, but how you can leverage on the adjacency to make these into a go-to places daily, weekly, so you can use it to generate a lot of uh, momentum on the site. What is also exciting is the red area. So right now there's already six blocks ready for development. And they're also within five minute walk from the LRT station with a, with a train arriving every three minutes that I was talking about. And we see that as a top party, very quickly thinking about how to orchestrate those as the developable land and also with the vibrant public spaces to unlock. So what we want to offer at the table is a very clear and simple partnership framework thinking about a three tier system, kind of like a wedding cake and using that to orchestrate opportunity for time and space share. Starting at the bottom level, focusing on institution. We know that there's broader uh, institution of uh, uh, opportunity for joint users and using that to really continue build the momentum for the lifelong learning. The, uh, middle uh, the middle portion, there's opportunity for the partnership floor. So this is uh, for the laboratory, for the businesses, for the offices. And what you want to do is to create a reason for people to come to this block and different times of the day, of the week, and also through the year. And then very importantly is that you want to sustain the critical mass on the same block. So when we look at housing, it's not just thinking about creating a one bedroom or co-living for the students, but it's also thinking about the faculty members, their families, and also how to make this as a place of choice for families of various sizes. So it's important that on early on to eliminate the need of parking and using that from a performer perspective to make the shift to uh, non-auto mode, but also using that to uh, support uh, these larger size units. So we know the tech company, they're looking for places, not just for the vibrant public spaces, 
but they are very mindful of sustainability. So using mass timber and, bio and, and biophilia will be a key differentiation. We also know that tech company, they're looking for the healthy lifestyle. So you already have a campus surrounded by river and creek. So how to be intentional creating the creek to creek connection. We know that there's a history about flooding. We know that there's a need of shade. So using that early on to set up this mechanism. And lastly, what we want to leave at the table is that over the last week, we really encourage to see the momentum and the excitement of people coming together. We see the physical model, but we also see there is an opportunity now to turn the physical model into a living digital model so that everybody can see what is happening on the ground. So we also learned that Denver has a legacy on uh, sustainability. So this is a very quick way, uh, apart from the collaboration, to continue putting Denver on the map, how we're meeting net zero, how we are continuing staying as a platinum for cities at the lead level, how Denver continue to be not just the fourth, maybe next time when we look at the news, it's the second uh, most sustainable destination in the world. Thank you. So the um, transportation challenge you face is balancing regional circulation needs with local access and the kinds of urban design moves that support a vibrant, walkable downtown that includes a major academic campus. So I think it's worth stepping back to consider the role that Spear Boulevard plays. It's a special and important route in the city. It is the rare radial avenue in the city that slices across the, uh, the city's grid. And that helps it link key destinations, Cherry Creek to downtown, and in recent decades, provides access to I-25. It serves as a gateway to downtown from I-25, but conversely, something of a backdoor entrance when you're coming from the south and across Colfax. And that has to do with the way that the Convention Center and Performing Arts Center back up to Spear. Um, never considered it a front door. It's a busy street carrying 50 to 60,000 vehicles a day, many of which get into downtown at Blake and Market. Although from the data we've seen, I'm sure it's out there, but from what we've seen, it's unclear how much of that traffic on Spear is through traffic and how much is going in and out of downtown. That needs to be better understood. Speed limit is posted at 35. It is pretty much universally accepted that many people travel faster. Nobody denied that fact um, in our discussions. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't actually been measured. So again, need to understand more precisely what is really going on. And relative to the number of people who are on the campus or working, living in downtown, there are few pedestrians crossing Spear. And in part, that's because it is a very wide street. Eight lanes with up to three turn lanes at any given intersection, making it one of the widest streets in Denver. You have other very equally, if not busier streets, Federal, Colorado, and others that typically have up to six lanes, but they carry even more traffic, over 70,000 vehicles a day in some cases. Spear also has a number of crosswalks. There are actually 15 marked crosswalks at 10 different intersections in this little over a mile. So it's an ample number of crossings, but again, they are daunting. Now, another important aspect of Spear is the history and aesthetic character. It follows a path that people have been taking along the creek for centuries. It offers compelling views of downtown and of the mountains. And even though its current configuration varies from the original city beautiful boulevard design, it remains a swath of green through downtown. That's an important aspect. And part of that design departure is now the width of the corridor, that's the roadway, the green space and the creek, varies widely anywhere from about 250 feet to over five, almost 600 feet. Um, a lot different than the traditional section south of Colfax, which is pretty typically about 250 feet in width. So 
a key thing to think about when you consider the entire downtown, Spear is not an edge, it's a central feature. Spear runs right through the middle of your functional downtown. So the question is, do you want the city's widest road right through the middle of downtown? I think we've been hearing many of you don't, but it's important to frame it in that context to think about the future. Now, at the finer level, the pedestrian experience is a long and awkward crossing. Again, um, Duke alluded earlier, there aren't a lot of reasons to cross Spear. It mainly has to do with activity on the campus um, or getting to and from transit or the Cherry Creek Trail. And it is the determined pedestrian who makes the crossing. It's a long distance. It takes a long time. Partly that's the corridor. Just getting across the street takes long enough, but then walking that nearly 600 feet, uh, we're talking almost two city blocks, just to get from one building on the east side to the next building on the west side. That's a long way. You have to endure high traffic volumes, the speed, the noise, and there's no weather protection, whether you're getting baked by the sun or uh, chilled by the uh, winter winds. It's a tough place to be as a pedestrian. So in short, Spear is incompatible with a successful walkable downtown due to the traffic conditions, due to its configuration and adjacent property conditions. So how can a better urban context be, situated, be um, achieved? That has to do with development patterns and design moves. And the panel believes strongly that the core of that improvement begins with a more vibrant um, AHEC campus with mixed use development. That development will generate more pedestrian traffic around the campus, between the campus and the central business district. And that more vibrant campus, mixed use campus has the opportunity to create visual attractions. One of the problems now is if you're on in the central business district, you look over, you may see one of the nice churches, but you can't see how to get there. At other streets, you see a parking garage wall, you, you see the backs of things, it doesn't lead you there. So we need to create reasons for people to go actual destinations and give them the visual clues as to how they get there. On the east side, if the Performing Arts Center and the Convention Center could develop front doors to Spear, could take advantage of an improved greenway, creek, and start to build natural connections to new activities on the mixed use campus. And then the thing you've all been waiting for is what is the new Spear Boulevard? The panel suggests that it be a six lane boulevard, that it occupy the west side of the current alignment, that it be more, uh, its design would be more traditional boulevard with a, a, a narrow but attractive planted median between the travel lanes. This would be consistent, the six lane section would be consistent with the traffic volumes it has been carrying. And they may be different in this slightly post pandemic future with the uh, downtown office core that remains to be seen. And that size would also be consistent with other major city streets relative to the volumes carried. Shifting and consolidating the boulevard would free up as much as 130 feet of depth for other uses, open space or other buildings. It gives a lot of flexibility to the future. Shifting the creek to the east side of the parkway is the right thing to do. This will help create a strong urban edge along the AHEC campus. And again, it provides more flexibility for uses on the east side and can create allow these um, central business district side buildings to have a new front door to a marvelous environmental and recreation corridor along the creek. So specifics of that new boulevard would be narrower lanes, 10 to 11 feet, not 11 and a half or 12 feet or larger, reducing the speed limit, it's now 35 to 25, Many cities are doing this. It's safer for pedestrians. Pedestrians tend not to die when collisions happen at lower speeds. It's that blunt. 
then there are a lot of turn lanes um, that could be eliminated, uh, particularly those that cut corners, leave pedestrians stranded on these little islands. And you can use the barriers for protected bike lane and landscaping that help create the sense of narrower street that helps slow traffic. These techniques should be applied both to Spear and Auraria Parkway. Spear alone cannot be fully improved if Auraria doesn't change with it. They work together, they need to have a comparable character. Now, what you can do straight away is test the six lane configuration within the existing boulevard. You can do it with temporary barriers, planters, and paint. You can create, if you choose, a two-way cycle track on each side of the street, a protected barrier. And then the inside, what is now the inside curb lane can be blocked off, and then it can become a turn lane as you approach intersections. Again, you can use temporary barriers to do that. Changing the paint, you can narrow the lanes. You can do this to test traffic behavior, test whether it actually does really slow traffic and test whether people will start to use the surface bike lanes and if pedestrians are more enticed to cross the street. This is a relatively low risk and low cost way to test big ideas. And then it's super important to monitor that performance apply the lessons learned as you refine the design for the future boulevard. Would also say, take that time to start using um, transportation models to test alternate intersection configurations. And you can test different ideas about how the central business district is gonna generate traffic in the future, whether we're gonna have people returning to the office or not, and test different volume scenarios. But you want to find out if you can alter intersections so that it helps reduce traffic speed and may support lane reduction, maybe even an additional lane reduction. Roundabouts, for example, um, are very efficient at these. They don't work everywhere, but they may well have an opportunity here. That could help you clean up some of the messiness around the Wazi, Blake, Market, Spear, Auraria intersection. It, um, that would really create a focal point and could um, better organize and make the whole area safer. And then um, the corridor crossings can be enhanced as Duke was suggesting, better landscaping, art, weather protection, a number of ways to make those more attractive to get you there. Your experience getting across a tame street would then be better. And the um, other ideas about crossings are that there may be opportunities to go over or go under. Um, while the main emphasis would always be to create a lively pedestrian environment at the surface, cities offer interesting potential. There might be fascinating experiences to be had by going over, going under. Don't rule it out, explore interesting opportunities. And then there are some additional actions to take. A collaborative and inclusive planning to make sure all of these things work together expand the geographic scope of downtown plans to include everything on the west side of Spear. It has to be a, an, a, an entire comprehensive view. Take a look at your zoning requirements. You've done a lot of good things to encourage um, better urban development and manage traffic, but take a hard look at establishing maximum parking ratios. That is the greatest tool you have to encourage transit, walking, and biking. Without a maximum parking ratio, your, your transit future is looks a lot like what it does now, which isn't bad, but it could be so much stronger. And then again, at the campus level, review the transportation benefits to see that they're maximizing use of transit and other modes. Rather than having to opt in, make a transit pass automatic. If you're enrolled or you work there, it's just built in to your fees. You don't have to, it's just there. You can use it anytime you want. Build on the collaborative planning across agencies, departments, and partners that you've done now. You can strengthen that and we'll need all voices and perspectives to make this work. Together, the panel believes these actions will help support a walkable, successful downtown.
Thank you, Ross. Well, you know, one thing um, that we heard from the very get-go that I think was uh, at the core of what we were asked to look at as a panel is how do you leverage the assets that are there, open space obviously being one of them, to stitch together uh, the various aspects of downtown across Spear Boulevard. And to do some stitching requires thread. And as Ross alluded, that does occur at the street level. That's where some of that experience is. But I also think, and I think we also believe, as do many of you who we spoke with, um, that green space really can be that thread. Um, it's important to note that the area where the Cherry Creek green space is currently aligned uh, has a rich but somewhat complicated history. It's been around as long as Denver has and obviously way, way before that. So um, just acknowledging that up front, I think what is interesting is as we look at some of the constraints, challenges and opportunities that we have today, a lot of those are rooted in decisions or actions from a hundred plus years ago. So looking at the existing condition, I think most of you have probably been down there, uh, so I don't need to enumerate all the different attributes of what currently exists, but I think there are key opportunities that are evident, even in its existing condition. And the biggest of those I, um, are things that are very difficult to recreate or to facilitate. And that's the presence of a natural water system, even if it's not the way that we would like it to be. Um, the amount of land in the public domain that the city and or its partners have influence over on how to develop 70 plus acres or something like that. Um, and the amount of potential partners that you have along these corridors to implement big visions. So we all know it's going to take a village, but coincidentally, along this section of Cherry Creek, you have institutions, higher education, businesses, downtown entities, um, and then obviously all of the residents that we hope will both move and stay in downtown Denver. Now, that goes without saying that there are also challenges. I think we could talk about, uh, the, you know, if you're down in the corridor itself, um, things you might see that are evident and also very common across most urban green spaces, things like, um, you know, continuous uh, congestion on some of the trail networks, general maintenance challenges, safety, you know, perceptions of safety. Um, but the most significant, I think, as we look through the lens of, open space being this thread that stitches together are the channelization of the creek, which makes it very difficult to access as a pedestrian. Uh, and that really also, as Ross clearly pointed out, starts at the street level. You know, the adjacency of Spear Boulevard in its current configuration really detracts from the amount of users and or uses that you can experience on Cherry Creek. Um, and the other thing too, is once you're down there, I think we heard this said a couple of times, there is no there there. You know, it really serves as a, thr a thoroughfare for pedestrians. And even in its current condition, it's quite beautiful, but it still is a pass through. So um, we touched on this already, but I think what the big idea of things that we've heard related to green space um, are very encouraging to me because there is this sort of understood uh, idea that the future of downtown, the future of Auraria, all of these are tied to the success of the open space system. Downtown Denver, to be successful, will need high quality, high performing uh, parks and open spaces to serve both the workers and the residents that we hope will live there. And I think an interesting uh, thought shift that occurred is as we looked at in the briefing materials and heard some conversations, this idea possibly that uh, Cherry Creek could be the backyard or, you know, it is this asset or this edge. When in reality, with the way that downtown has evolved and grown as we redefine where these quote unquote barriers, these imaginary barriers of downtown are, it really isn't that. It's a central spine. You know, it is a central park of sorts, not in its scale or program, but in its importance of connecting and unifying different portions of the city. So what do we do about that? Um, I'd like to start macro as we kind of already have. We started at the very, very high level and we're working our way down. So with open space as well, I think we have an opportunity as a community to think about this space differently. You know, this is not a trail. This is not a park. This is not infrastructure. It's all of those things. And it's also a vehicle for conveying the unique culture, both past and present of Denver. And we need to embrace it and plan it and brand it that way. That will help give life to the space that is beyond circulation, beyond just recreation or beyond infrastructure, is just reframing the way that we think about it. Uh, and this is a tenet that I, I hope most of us embrace, and it's certainly a soapbox that I stand on frequently, but we understand that there are infrastructural requirements of the Cherry Creek Greenway. 
That goes without saying. And those must be maintained and preserved in the future. But we have to think differently about how we meet and solve those challenges. There is the opportunity to look at this, this entire corridor as both infrastructure and amenity. You know, we're protecting downtown. Um, you know, we're retaining the existing flood uh, capacity. We're dealing with, you know, all of those things that we know we have to, but we can do that in ways that naturalize the creek alignment and open up green space. We can do that by thinking about walls differently and solutions of walls differently than just purely vertical plans. So I think with this also, it's not enough to think about it as infrastructure, to design it as infrastructure. We have to fund it as infrastructure. And that's not just the flood walls or the, you know, the flood improvements, that's the entire green space because it is infrastructure, quality of life infrastructure for the city of Denver. And piggybacking on that, you have an opportunity here as we look forward into the future in a very um, dynamic and changing climate that we need to leverage as a community all the tools in our toolbox for resiliency that we can. And as we think about people coming and moving and living downtown, um, you, of course, you're dealing with the urban heat island effect and all these other, you know, things that we're experiencing. I think it's been a pretty hot week for us here. Uh, we've enjoyed it, but it's been warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to experience the need for this, right? Um, but the Cherry Creek Cultural Corridor has the opportunity to really be a tool for resiliency in the community. If you've been down there, um, which if you haven't, I'd encourage you to go. Even on a hot day, there is a change in temperature. There's a change. Just being near the water is something that is so valuable in a climate like Denver's that you cannot not embrace it to its fullest potential. So as we think about the big broad vision of everybody in this room, which is that we have a dynamic, active, sustainable, and livable Denver, that means that we have to mitigate these effects of climate change that are not gonna change in the short term. Um, one of the key direct questions we were asked as part of our briefing material is to how do we increase the amount of green space along uh, Spear Boulevard? Um, I'd like to add a caveat here that it's not just increasing, which I think is a valid goal that should be pursued. It's increasing meaningful and interconnected spaces. So it's not green for green's sake. It's green spaces that facilitate all these broader citywide goals that we know we need to meet. And that's everything from recreation and leisure, obviously, to catalyzing and facilitating private development and invest investment. They are not mutually exclusive ideas. So increasing green space, prioritizing green space, does not preclude private development and all these other broad goals that we wanna see. In fact, we believe it encourages them. And a key aspect of that is um, thinking about parks differently along this corridor, parks and green spaces. You know, we have already seen, I think, uh, some different illustrations of potential uh, elevated green spaces, which cross sphere. And as Ross said, those are things that are worthwhile exploring in certain circumstances. But we also think there are opportunities to go under and connect different portions of the campus to downtown where you are avoiding sphere and creating these unique new dynamic uh, connections from east to west uh, that are green space connections, not just streetscape or elevated connections. So what's cool to me about this idea is that we're thinking about parks on multiple, parks and green spaces on multiple planes. So for example, here we're standing by the, <laughs> what can be a somewhat intimidating sculpture here in one of the larger green spaces along the corridor looking towards the campus, which on the other side of the massive divide of sphere, there's also a pretty large unprogrammed green space. Well, this is one of the most difficult areas to traverse as a pedestrian. So we have the opportunity as we rethink how we orient the creek and how we handle some of these flood related challenges to create some of these underpasses, these under parks, which are becoming much more common uh, as unique programmable dynamic urban areas that are very different, that can become destinations and have unique attributes, namely shade, uh, that can help in the larger perspective of resiliency. And along with that and tied to that idea is this need to create destinations along the corridor. There's not one end or the other. This should be an experience uh, across the entire corridor. And a key component of this is making sure that these destinations are multi-generational, multifaceted, and multi-seasonal. You know, they should appeal uh, and have some appeal to every resident of Denver or the area campus, regardless of age, ability, or level of access to the space. Um, and you're gonna do this by embracing things that we've already heard so far today, like this whole notion of place being, you know, at the core of design decisions. 
Um, but this really will be key to bringing families to downtown and to their area campus. There has to be some place where you can take your child to play. There has to be some place great to throw a Frisbee with your dog. There has to be a great place to play pickup basketball. Right now, there's not. So we have to figure that out. And we think there's a great opportunity to do that here. You also have the opportunity to, because of all these great partners, you know, the cultural institutions that line both sides, to have those uses, activities, programs spill into and leverage the new green space that's created as these walls of Cherry Creek are rethought and green spaces are opened up. Another thing that we heard uh, over and over again is that even in its current configuration, Cherry Creek is extremely well used. You know, I was out there a couple times. I feel like I'm a fairly astute pedestrian, given my uh, planning background. I was almost hit twice. <laughs> uh, they were both my fault, so I'll, I'll own that. But um, it's a very, very congested bicycle thoroughfare. And that's an important function that this Greenway needs to provide. But we also cannot do that at the expense of other uses, other quality of life uses. Think walking your dog, your child, a stroller. So looking at separating in this new alignment, this through commuter traffic from these other uses, which could also include things like hiking or single tracks and all these different cool things we could integrate down there. But separation and capacity is key. So right now the trail is far too narrow for even the capacity it currently has. So we need to think about that differently and then also include some separation in there. And what will help this, as Ross mentioned, is integrating some of that really through traffic in a pedestrian friendly, desirable way at the street level in, as we rethink through Boulevard. So we shouldn't think that the creek as it is right now is the only means of uh, safe bicycle transportation uh, between A and B. You know, Spear also has to do that. And tied to that, you know, you have some of the unique challenges here in this environment where the, the creek is recessed and will continue to be, uh, regardless of how we change the edges, where you have, I think I counted at 20, almost 20, 19 or 20 different overpasses that as a, if you transverse Cherry Creek from the river all the way to Colfax, you're continually going under these different environments. And yes, a lot of them do have some security lighting, but they also, even with that, are not really great places to be during the day um, in broad daylight. And there's ways that are lighter, quicker, cheaper, you know, placemaking ways that you can activate those spaces uh, with art and additional light, things of that nature that will increase the usability and sense of comfort in those spaces, which in turn increases the amount of users that you have that were willing to visit the creek. We did hear from some people, they say, I'm not even willing to go down there. I heard it's cool, it kind of looks cool, but I'm not going down there. So that's something that we have to address both in its current configuration and in the recommendations we make moving forward. Okay, so those are big ideas. And I promise we, oops, too far there. Um, those are big ideas. I promise we'd start at the very top and we'd work our way down. I think what's encouraging about uh, this vision is that it does start at the macro level. We need a master plan, a corridor master plan that looks comprehensively at all these different infrastructural systems and elements through the lenses of green space and let that drive the vision for this corridor. Right now, that doesn't exist yet. You know, we think we have a very broad picture of what that could be, but there's a lot of details and analysis that need to be fleshed out and a lot of community engagement and participation that ultimately will determine whether or not this is successful that has to be included. The other opportunity you have right now is because of all the new development taking place and all the interest in the adjacent parcels, you need to partner and leverage that opportunity to see if there are any economies of scale that can be realized by implementing portions of improvements along the creek in concert with those developments. Now, let me be explicit. That doesn't mean we're shifting costs of those onto private developments, but rather leveraging the fact that, you know, there are economies of scale that can be realized. And I think regardless of how you look at this, as important as I think funding is, um, there is no one silver bullet. There's no source that's going to get the check today where we could do this all at once. So we have to be opportunistic. And that's also tied to this idea of finding partners. And it's kind of easy, I think, in the world of funding to sell a big idea or a building or an improvement. But we also have to find partners for both operations, activation, and maintenance. The life of this space really just begins the day the construction is done. And that will ultimately, how you plan for that proactively, will ultimately influence the success of the space. Um, one thing that, and I, I feel like I need to look where the exits are here before I say this, um, <laughs> we need to think about uh, with regard to the amount of development that's coming to, uh, potentially coming to this area of downtown and down, downtown more broadly, um, is how do we ensure that that development is equitable to the existing residents? And one way to do that is to make sure that there's some mechanism in place, whether that's an impact fee structure, which is fairly successful from a park's perspective. Um, but we want to make sure 
that the level of service per resident of green space in and around downtown Denver doesn't decrease as new residents come. We want new residents to come, but there has to be funding mechanisms and equitable funding mechanisms that offset the burden placed on the open space system by those new residents. So you already do a good job, Denver already actually does a pretty good job of leveraging most of the different types of funding mechanisms that I would advocate for up here, uh, but that is one that's missing. Um, and again, I wanna be clear that this is focused on not increasing level of service, but strictly maintaining. So it's a fair, it can be developed in a fair and equitable way that does not dissuade development. And again, you do a good job funding, don't leave anything on the table. You're gonna to need to keep leveraging every single funding source that you're using now to realize Cherry Creek over the generations to come. And then the cool thing about that, even in the perspective of generational improvement is there are things you can do today to start to activate that space. There is such value, I think, in building awareness and advocates through immediate, lighter, quicker, cheaper style interventions, place-based interventions, art-based interventions, pedestrian-based interventions in the space that as people realize the potential of that asset, they will then be advocates on your behalf as communities, developers, cities, when you go out to pursue these bigger, broader projects. Because right now, I don't think Cherry Creek is seen for the potential that it could be as the Cherry Creek Cultural Corridor which is a totally different idea. So very cool, very big things you can do right now, today. Well, tomorrow, but tomorrow. All right, and with that, uh, I'd like to start, or I'd like to conclude our discussion the way we started, which is a conversation, a dialogue with all of you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Marilyn, take us through some questions. <laughs> okay, it's your turn. Yeah. Please tell us your name. And we recognize that. Um, and Part of the uh, recommendation is to test other intersection types. Um, one of the things I observe with Spear right now is the way the signals meter traffic. Um, you get what we call in traffic business platoons, great bunches of cars um, moving together. Once they're through, then there's just a lot of empty space for quite a while until the, net, the signal cycles again. Um, other intersections smooth out the flow. When cars don't stop, you don't have to stack them up and store them. Um, often you can make do with fewer lanes if they can all keep moving through. They don't have to move quickly and we don't want them going too quickly right through the middle of downtown. It still needs to be compatible with the pedestrian environment. Um, that's why we suggest doing the modeling to see how much more efficient can the intersections function so that you don't need so many lanes. And the, the Spear does carry a lot of traffic now. We know it's carried a lot in the past uh, pre-pandemic. Um, the big question is, what is the future of the downtown office market? This is plaguing cities all over the country. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest in the near term, there'll be far fewer people commuting in on any given day. 10, 15 years from now, that could change. That's why modeling will let you test a lot of different future scenarios and see what makes the most sense. Thank you. Uh, hand in the third, uh, in the fourth row back there, please introduce yourself. Ex hold on, please. Uh, we have to make sure that if you have a question, you have to speak in the microphone for it to be recorded. So if you could wait for one of us to get. Thank you, Jill Locantore with the Denver Streets Partnership. Um, kind of related couple of questions. I was really appreciated the panel's focus on all the light rail stations and the opportunity for transit oriented development. Wonder if you thought at all about the role of transit on Spear Boulevard itself, um, particularly given that the Den Denver Moves Transit Plan identifies Spear Boulevard as a potential BRT corridor. Um, and also I was thrilled to see the suggestion of fewer lanes, adding a cycle track, reducing the speed limit to 25 miles per hour. From my perspective, six lanes is still a very wide street. 
And I'm curious if you have any precedent examples of six lane boulevards that are designed to actually effectively reinforce a speed of 25 miles per hour. Maybe I can start off, um, can you hear me? So maybe I can start off talking about from a public realm and transit oriented communities perspective. We see there's definitely opportunities to double up the uses. We know the city of Denver has a very ambitious target, which, which is needed, which is about making the modal shift to majority of the trips is by walking, cycling, and transit. So what is interesting, we're thinking about from a loop perspective, notwithstanding you did major long trips to justify the need for shared mode, there's opportunity to utilize one of the lanes and using that to very quickly to provide for the share micro mobility um, uh, 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 local transit. And then I will have uh, Ross uh, provide more input. In the long run, maybe it might be possible to have fewer than six lanes. Um, and that's why I keep suggesting you need to test future scenarios to see what is realistic. Um, and again, need to understand how how people use Spear, how much of that is traffic to and from I-25 moving through, how much is in and out of downtown. To the extent that it's traffic in and out of downtown, there's a much greater ability to manage demand. That's why I say you got to start with looking at the parking ratios. You've got an ample transit system, but if you have ample parking, they're working at cross purposes. So over time, um, the parking ratios need to come down so that people have real reason to consider alternatives. In terms of um, Spear as a uh, high transit corridor, BRT corridor, that will come as development right along Spear comes. Right now, for transit to go down Spear, it would be going out of direction for where people are getting on and off the buses. So there needs to be immediate immediately adjacent development to uh, justify that. Um, again, a future possibility, and there is the room to accommodate that. Um, it's only quite recently that cities have started adopting um, standards more appropriate to urban conditions for their street designs. Traditionally, lanes have been quite wide that had to do with where the money came from and the fact that we, re we really didn't have urban standards. We had highway interstate standards, so we had wide lanes. We're now applying narrower lanes and um, cities across the country reducing speed limits. So it takes a combination of how you design the street as well as the speed limit to help slow traffic, but I think it's totally achievable. Yes, sir. Hi, Fred Glick. Uh, thanks. I, one quick one about the testing. I would like to highlight that within the last couple of years, uh, Dottie did close down some lanes on Spear and convert them to bike lanes when they were doing a bridge reconstruction. So there's probably some data related to that. Dottie planners have actually done a really good job of using those opportunities to collect data and prove that traffic Armageddon doesn't necessarily happen. Um, I was curious, you, you talked about eliminating some of the uh, right-hand turns that cut across the corner. What about raised crosswalks? I often here it's dismissed because apparently it doesn't work with snow plows, although Boulder does it and I think they get snow up there too, but I, I am kind of curious your thoughts on, on using those as a way to help calm the traffic and create a, a safer environment for pedestrians. I think there's mixed experience with the effectiveness of raised crosswalks. Um, depending on how they're designed, it can certainly highlight the fact that there is a pedestrian crossing, um, just alert drivers to that. The, um, the profile of that raise, um, may or may not slow traffic. I've seen that and as well as speed cushions, a whole variety of techniques used. People who drive the route frequently learn the speed at which they can go over that comfortably, which may be faster than what um, you know, the engineers and planners intended to happen. Um, I think what is more important is the pedestrian's experience. Um, 
So if we can slow traffic generally, narrow the distance they have to cross, even with paint and then other um, lighting, making the crosswalk highly visible is the most important thing. Um, I would say look to local experience with raised crosswalks to see how effective they've been. Um, it's a lot of, if they're not effective, you can deploy that money more efficiently elsewhere. If they've been shown to work well, have at it. I would like to add to that point is that uh, city of Stockholm in Sweden, they have adopted a strategy looking at vision zero very differently. They know people are going to make mistakes. They know the city is having an aging population, very similar to the situation in Denver. So from a design standpoint, is they making it very visible and easy for pedestrians. They know that uh, the city is spending a lot of money on the hospitalization because of seniors falling on the street. They also have winter situation just like we did. So what they have is a 10 meters wide crossing with raised crosswalk, and it's also done with granite. So it provides for the opportunity for durable and very high quality seamless experience. Another example is that in Amsterdam, they see that when there is accident, it's a design problem. So instead of waiting for a long uh, traffic studies and pilot to get data, they go in and fix it from day one. So I think through this strategy, there is opportunity to uh, look at it differently. And then lastly, what I like to add at the table is that looking at district energy. So thinking about how you can use those uh, sources of energy to have an alternative. Maybe it's not about um, snow plowed. Maybe there's a different way of making those as clear um, uh, for your uh, all year long. Uh, Chris Shears, uh, this is for Duke. I know we want to focus on crossing Spear Boulevard and traffic. And Ross, you're the you're the guy this morning. But Duke, could you talk a little bit more about the opportunities associated with opening up more developable real estate in order to encourage uh, the connection? Sure. Um... Arizona State University is a state university as is implied in its title. We're always short of resources. It was only in the past decade plus that we began to look at the land that we controlled or that friends controlled or that the city controlled as an asset. Even land that was given to our foundation, our philanthropic arm, nobody knew what to do with it and they just sold it. Now, if somebody gives us a piece of land, somebody gave us something in California, uh, I think it's worth $5 million. We think if we spend $2 million, it can be worth $50 million. Land is valuable. So land around us, we now begin to look at as what it can contribute to the educational mission and the education of students. And if you're short of resources, how do you diversify those resources? So we're combining land and the big mission of the institution. But we have found that we are sitting on a lot of it. Uh, and that if that's 77 acres, I've heard different numbers in terms of acreage, but let's call it that, uh, was looked at as you stood back from it, what is its value? Obviously, each of the three institutions should benefit. Each should continue to do what they need to do either on that land or elsewhere. But if you really imagined its possibilities, which we would certainly do because we've hired a lot of developers, they're on our team. What do you think we could do with this? And who would occupy it? Is that for students? Is that for research? This thing called an innovation district, which is in the mind's eye. How could you build that out with the folks doing the things at the ball arena? There is a huge opportunity along that edge to do something significant with a development partner. So we just view everything, whether it's in an urban core situation like this, which we've now learned to handle extremely well, and the city turns to us for development. Or if it's uh, almost greenfield things, we inherited an airport in Mesa. We're developing that. We're looking for partners. And in every case, we expect some pretty significant investments on the part of those municipalities in terms of infrastructure. We just, we analyze and interrogate land in a very different way related to the mission of the university. And it's about, at the end of the day, diversifying your resource pool to be able to do the things you want to do. I would say one other thing about that, we're also known as having enormous online presence, which we've invested a ton of money in. 
We have 85,000 students on our campuses and 130 degree seeking students, 130,000 degree seeking students online. Online has raised the profile of our on site. People see the quality of our online. We're not the University of Phoenix. Hope nobody's here from University of Phoenix. <laughs> Where we are in Phoenix. But, but you know, those things are not incompatible either. The virtual and the actual support each other. The fact that you are a real campus with real faculty doing real things makes your online more valuable. Your online is a front door to engaging us further. So it's interesting that the virtual and the real, the analog uh, play together. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Dunn. I'm a landscape architect. So this is going to sound somewhat sacrilegious, but did you look at this uh, width of the medians and consider whether those should be, you know, we're, we're really looking at square feet in this whole corridor. And um, it seems that, you know, most of the boulevards that were developed over the years were done to connect the city with the suburbs. And that, um, you know, we're looking at Cherry Creek North right now, which was de developed uh, First Avenue in a very suburban sort of mall style of street. And so I'm wondering if, you know, at a certain point, Colfax through the rest of the city, if that could be maybe a narrower uh, median, because the goal is to narrow the width of the whole right of way and make that a higher quality landscape rather than, you know, just these little pieces. But um, is, would that be a, a value to narrow the right of way and, and uh, reduce that median size? Sure, I can, uh, I'll take a stab at this and turn it over to the person who knows more about roads too. But, um, you know, when we looked at, uh, or through the lens of prioritizing place and experience and connectivity, uh, you know, spear is important, but our goal was to minimize the width of that section as much as possible through this corridor um, without compromising functionality. And part of that was narrowing, at least, you know, in terms of the standards or typical cross sections that we considered, significantly narrow, narrowing that median in this section. So I don't know that I could spout off the exact width, but I would say there's some areas where it's 20, 30, 40 plus feet wide, right, Ross, right now? Oh, yeah. Um, between Colfax and Araria, it's all over the place. Oh, yeah. And it gets well, that's, that's quite wide. Um, and... Uh, I'll answer the question for the section north of Colfax that, that we've looked at. Um, we would shift the creek to the east side, so that differentiates it from the section south of Colfax where the road's straddling the creek. And then I think the um, what we considered, this is not a, um, a fixed number, what we were considering was a median that's somewhere in the 16 to 20 or 24 feet of width. You could, accrete, you could achieve a gracious tree-line boulevard with those dimensions uh, quite easily. The important thing is, you know, we still need to try to shorten the length of the pedestrian crossing. They get a refuge at the median, but still, we're, we're not trying to make this um, a hike to get from downtown to the campus or vice versa. Um, so I think graciousness that complements good function, and then the more... The important thing is to achieve that usable space on the east side of the uh, the roadway, whether that will be um, to park space, part of the creek or building area to be determined, but that's the most valuable space. So a big wide median uh, doesn't contribute to that. And you can still have a, a beautifully landscaped, gracious boulevard with a 16 foot median. I think Yvonne and I also have something. Yeah. Okay, so what I'd like to add to that is that um, there's an interesting observation. When you're articulating the question, you talk about this is a suburban design and how to move that to be an urban area. So what we find is interesting is that there's a general need of humanizing material. So how do you create expectation? This is a slow space. So it's not just fixing the North-South Spear uh, Boulevard from an experience standpoint, but it's also the east-west experience standpoint. So looking at Colfax as a slow space, as your main street. So creating that expectation. So when people are coming to the city, whether they are arriving by walking, cycling, transit, or by car, they know there's expectation you're entering a very vibrant, slow urban space. 
I would just make the observation relative to the questions that have been asked, which are all really good ones. And by the way, they're, they're the right ones to ask. You live here. It's your street. It's your park. It's your place. But to do some of the things that are being proposed by my colleagues who, by the way, this is a great team, wonderful people, super smart. You ought to do what they're suggesting. But when, when the construction comes around, if that's what you're going to do, and the disruption, which will be measured in years, the question will be asked, to what end? So I would say take their advice, but make sure that it's driven towards a larger community goal, city goal, urban goal. It helps you to overcome the disruption and the nuisance, which is for real and it affects businesses and, and others. So what's the bigger idea that I think is connected to the future of downtown Denver, which has ebbed and flowed? I've seen it for decades, right? Maybe it's a low ebb. We want to pick it back up again. Where's education go here? There are no great cities without great universities, great educational systems. They need places, but ultimately you need leadership. Who's going to carry the water on this? Now, is it the mayor? I'm, I'm any mayor, not the particular mayor in place. Is it the university president? Is it the development community? But a big idea needs strong leadership, which then when this stuff gets executed and everybody's glad when it's done, you knew what you were headed towards. And I would suggest couching the specifics in a larger frame all the time. Thank you. I'm Norbert Chavez with CU Denver. Uh, Duke, I wanna just build on what you just said because I think that's the important uh, point to what end are we going through this entire process? Uh, because what we've seen is we've seen that we continue, we will continue to have the clash or the conflict between pedestrians and, and cars. That will not change with, with this plan. The over under conversation is the only way that we decouple that conflict. And to the extent that it's worth doing, and we're, we're changing the routing of the river and we're rebuilding the entire stretch of Spear, why don't we think a little bit bigger and decouple that conflict that exists? If we do that, there'll be a free flow of pedestrians back and forth across Spear, which will allow for the, for the uh, um, development on the opposite side of Spear to flourish. And the, and the conflict with those pedestrians will not exist. We won't have to have the conversation about how wide the lane is necessarily or the median or how none of that becomes as paramount as it is today if we figure out that, that free flow and, and decouple that conflict. And building on my comments and what you just said, chicken and egg, build the flow first, flow to what? And Laura had a great uh, diagram, uh, who's, who I really respect, your city planner. Two arrows between the Auraria campus and downtown. One of those areas is functional. Students are crossing to go into downtown. Not happening the other way, as I mentioned, someone in this audience suggested they'd never crossed Spear. I would suggest build the magnet on the other side that says that's worth getting to. We need to now work on that flow. I think you build the flow first before you know what you're going flowing to. That's a real challenge in terms of leadership and presentation of the big idea, but they both got to happen. You're absolutely right. In fact, we, we prefer to envision a coming together across time. Won't be in every place. The, se the, se the sections will continue to be different, but the notion of these two mixed use, very important interrelated integrated districts is really a goal to reach for as well, I think. Sorry, Chris. I'll be, yeah, okay, you're up. Hi, um, my name is Luna Hoops. I heard a couple of mentions of the displaced residents and businesses that have you know, previously been displaced and obviously those that have the potential um, and then also the history of indigenous people in the area that I think was most, most reflected in um, the cultural corridor idea. But I'm wondering if you have any specific examples or ideas on how these communities can meaningfully and financially benefit from this potential development. I can take a, a quick stab at that, uh, at least the first part of it. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about when we looked through the lens of open space is how, how again, I'm beating a dead horse here, but how do we leverage that open space to achieve these much broader goals? And one of the things that we heard consistently over and over again is this need for high quality, uh, well-connected, but affordable housing options in downtown. And so as we look at moving the creek, uh, creating this cultural corridor that also 
tells a story, even if it's a complicated one about the history of Denver and the people groups that were here before, um, can we do that in a way that it generates equitable and accessible amenities for those populations? So I think affordable housing is part of that. I think awareness and education are part of that on a broad scale, obviously, um, because those, uh, the more educated and aware, uh, you know, Denverites are, then the more of these types of um, reparative actions will occur in the future. So it's also catalyzing that idea in addition to some immediate, uh, more tangible fiscal benefits that we would hope those populations would enjoy. So thank you for inviting me today. 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 Um, where it was a cultural corridor and through a, a portion of Indianapolis with a pretty storied and very difficult history. And um, one of the barriers that we found in terms of building consensus around investment in it is just the lack of awareness of the significance of the story. And once we were able to overcome some of that uh, through demonstrative projects, through advocacy, awareness, things of that nature, um, we found we had more advocates uh, and that opened up more opportunities. So is it the end all? No. But it, it's part of a very, you know, I think we're all aware, a very complicated issue that needs to be addressed, but it's going to be in bites at a time. And it's a combination of things. You have to put your money where your mouth is. And we've all seen areas where previously they were thriving neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods were somehow needed for other things and people were moved out. Uh, I think all three institutions on their area campus have recognized that. They've offered scholarships to people who are living now and generations to come, which for free in perpetuity, which is a hugely important gesture. And I'll just say, we, we just received a, a very generous $300 million gift to name a college downtown in Phoenix. That would never have come if we hadn't gone there first. And a major portion of that gift was for a one square mile project in an area that was once thriving, why people came to Phoenix, Maryvale, it's now the most depressed. We are dedicating that money to everything that community needs, both in terms of scholarship and and on the ground activity, you've got to demonstrate that you really are committed to these things. And, and I think these institutions are and can do more. That's why we're trying to get them more resources. And it happens to be related to the place. And I would just like to add to that is that there are examples of how to utilize the upcoming infrastructure uh, activities to create a local advisory council, potentially using that to be intentional to create job opportunities and training opportunities through a social development plan. So the beauty of that is that you can use that to start to create a definitive um, area of focuses so that uh, any business planning, any of the infrastructure planning or any advocacy or storytelling has a clear definitive area that everybody feel they have a shared vision. This is Tim Jordan again. I won't ask any more questions, but I'm one, one point of curiosity for me is now where does this get handed off to? And this is really interesting in what's been presented here, but I don't know where it goes from here. Who's, who's, what's the entity that get handed to and tries to keep the ball moving? This is the moment to turn to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Aldrete. I'm the Executive Director of Community Planning and Development for the city and county of Denver. Um, and I, I would say, right, we are here, not just as a city and county of Denver, but with CU Denver, with AHEC, with Downtown Denver Partnership. And uh, from the beginning of these conversations that have started three years ago, what I recognized is that it is gonna be the stakeholders around SPEAR that are gonna have to come together in addition to the city to um, move this forward. And so after this, I think we will, as you know, as the recommendations came out, uh, are, are, are coming out and presented this morning, it is as much about the campus as it is about the downtown, as it is about the infrastructure and the parks and all the elements, the community development uh, elements of the city that we will only be successful if we come together and work on this as, um, a, as a complete community. So. What's our next steps? I think laying out, you know, what are, are, are there some low hanging fruit that each of us can take on that falls within our 
bailiwick that moves our mission forward and then also began doing some of that long range planning uh, to begin testing these, these elements. I think the great idea of, you know, you don't have to invest that, you don't have to take a gamble on infrastructure, on millions of dollars of infrastructure. There's a, um, some great examples or, or testing that you can do short term that is low cost that we can find out, is it, does it work or not? And if, if it's not working, we can back it out and try it again. So I think those are some of the, the places I'm going to be from the city standpoint, be interested in looking uh, towards implementing. I would add to that is uh, when we look at the city, it doesn't say state land, city land. It just says, this is the city and this is where we're going. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes city and state are clashing with each other, but more and more times they are working together with each other. And the state has capacities for, uh, uh, for uh, raising revenues for uh, within the mission but yet making it available for other ancillary projects that really serve the mission as well. So for instance, uh, uh, affordable housing out at the Western uh, Light Rail Transit and the next neighborhood never oh, right, right under the highway there. Uh, those, there are ways to uh, find resources and open them for use with, with the state that are somewhat different in the city. And so I think it is really important to remember that that's the low lying condition and match the match the initiatives we want to take with the funding that we're most likely to get. Anthony. Yeah. Anthony. Yeah, I just just I guess I'll take executive privilege right now. So, <laughs> Rodney Milton, ULI, Colorado. I'm executive director here, and I think that's where the opportunity for ULI, Colorado in terms of socializing the understanding of what the recommendations are, right? So that folks can understand where their place is in the implementation process, where the community is in that implementation process, but also in engaging the enabling of the implementation side of it. So when there are sticky points around the implementation side, so how do we do this and how do we enable it to happen? ULI Colorado still has the pull of 45 thousand, we're looking at 46 members to continue the conversation on the enabling factor. My background as a city planner, I'm all about doing it and making sure that it's capable of being done and finding those champions and amplifying that those champions that can understand what needs to be done, because we're talking 10, 15, 20 years out of implementation and guiding folks along that way, because ULI Colorado will be here. I'd like to just add a quick thought to that that I think is important, um, and we hit on it a couple different times, but as we looked at what were very specific questions related to specific infrastructural assets, we tried to think about those through what could be a much bigger shared vision, and I hope that came through in, in the way we presented this. Um, but one of the things that I mentioned um, specifically through the lens of open space, but I think is applicable from a principal standpoint, is the need to develop a corridor master plan for this whole area that takes into account the various uh, vested interests of the different entities that will ultimately deliver it so that everyone can A, participate in the process in addition to the community and all those givens, but um, and B, see and quantify the value that they will receive. So as we look forward into the future, it's, it's changing the paradigm of, you know, I think an analogy that we use was this, this idea that right now, at least from an outside perception, um, you know, AHEC or the individual universities, the private developments, downtown business district, look, everybody's kind of, it's like houses in the same neighborhood, right? But I think the bigger picture is it's not houses in the same neighborhood. We're all family members that live in the same house. And we all need to care for, steward, maintain, this house and that house is downtown Denver. And if we can establish or create a big enough picture that is realistic and actionable that everyone can get behind, this idea of who is the person that is solely responsible for implementing becomes a non-issue because everybody wants to implement it. Everybody sees their value from the citizen to the corporate entity. So I think that's key, uh, a key first step. Uh, Anthony. So Ryan, that was beautiful. I, I think uh, I'm conjuring images of a house party, actually, right? Festive, bringing everybody together for a celebration of what is possible on Spear Boulevard. So, so first, let me just thank you all for a really thoughtful analysis of 
Spear Boulevard and all the constituencies that are tied uh, to its future. It's quite inspiring to see how the, the wealth of your talents come to, coming together can paint a brighter picture of what may be possible uh, for our city. I, I wanna ask you briefly about East-West connections. It's, it's amazing to think through how transit oriented development and increased density, right? Looking at repositioning surface parking and these sorts of things will get us closer to our goal. But I'd love to hear your reflections on existing east-west connections and the potential of potentially enhancing Larimer or others that go directly across Spear, in addition to the road diets and expansion of green space. You know, I, I think I, I think we all covered that to some degree. So maybe you're asking for like just a little bit more. Can you really do it? Uh, and I think the work that Andrew showed us, what you saw in the plans, there's clearly an understanding of Larimer as the direction to the West and, and, and starting point. And obviously it comes into a great urban asset. Um, you know, if you, if you asked me about uh, a really super specific, in one of the documents we were given by the city and maybe initiated some of this, I think it was in Laura's deck. There's a little plot that's a parking lot and developers wanted it and it's sitting right next to the bridge that uh, 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 Andrew's working on. You know, if it is a wide crossing, 300 feet, 400 feet, you could have something come up right there, a little tower of a building that was the gateway introduction. It could be a coffee shop. It could literally give you information about the universities. It could give you information about the city. An actual stop midway as you're making your way across there, that could become a unique feature in addition to some of the visual elements we showed. So you've got to look both big picture and really at the detail where there are opportunities to signal something that is unexpected, really functional, people start to gather around it. So I'd be looking for those moments that there is so much space, so much land, so much opportunity to do those kinds of things there. I'd be seeking those out wherever you could. and and. They're easy wins. That's low-hanging fruit could be transformative. And some of those could be student-generated projects yeah. from art programs, architecture, urban design. There could be all kinds of installations that keep changing and evolving and catch people's eye and give them a reason to walk down there. And maybe they keep going a little further. Um, there are temporary plantings that could be put in. There are a lot of things that could make it more attractive, appealing, and enjoyable. And they can be temporary as well as permanent. Yep. Uh, one great thing that we had in some open space between a couple of streets in New York, at the last, our last election, we put up the transit, transition tent and everybody could come in and talk. And literally thousands of people came in and sat on milk cartons and other things and had a community experience and an interaction with people they might not see in the same way. So I think it's a great place to experience. And, and you may find that you do wanna leave voids at certain points to therefore heighten the, the visibility and the usability of those places that you do really wanna occupy. Thank you, Marilyn and Ross. I'm Nan Ellen, Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning at CU Denver. And I was just gonna say that, and first of all, I wanna thank you all. That was incredible presentation, fantastic proposals. So grateful to the amazing sponsors who made this happen. Um, we in the College of Architecture and Planning started a Living Urban Campus Initiative about eight months ago, and we've had many meetings with many people here. And I should say we have a number of our advisory board members here, Eugene Howard, Bob Packard, David Scheiba, Bobby Milton, and others, and many alumni are here too. We've been working on this for years. You've definitely taken it to another level. Uh, we're really, really grateful for that. Our Living Urban Campus Initiative, actually, we've raised money from a, an alum to do design build projects on campus. So we're doing both. We're looking at the big picture like you did, but then I love how you added a little bit at the end, Marilyn, the next steps. And then at the end, this is how we're gonna implement. Um, so we can, we want to, we want to help. We want to be involved. Um, I know we had two of our students helping you with this project too. So, but the question I have is more about, I'd like to hear from you since we have you here, more about the time frame. And the time frame. And um, Duke, you mentioned the word disruption. So we're sensitive to that too, because we as our various institutions, we have plans, we have strategic plans. 
we don't really want a big dig. Because I worked on, I worked on we, big dig. You know, I know you I did. wonder if Boston still wants to We don't want a big dig, dig in Denver. We, we know it's going to take time. We know it's going to take other resources. But what do you truly envision to be a realistic time frame for what you proposed? And the second part of that, I'm curious if you have more ideas about that 130 feet of newly developable land on the east side, what you envision for that? Maybe I can start off with what is immediate can be done. So city across the world, including Paris, uh, we're looking about five weeks, five weeks implementation, how you can leverage before people going back to school. And uh, it could be a very quick fix, um, putting artificial sand, in the area, setting up uh, opportunities. And it's kind of like a meanwhile strategy. In other words, very quickly, you created two node as an outdoor destination, creating reason for people to uh, see the creek. So, um, so those are a, a key uh, uh, a quick win. Another piece is that from a zero to two years perspective is that you want to articulate a series of uh, capital public space project as your pipeline. And that would help to continue build the momentum and putting uh, Denver on the map at a global stage. Um, I'll, I'll add a little bit of a layer to that as we looked at, uh, and I mentioned this in my presentation, but the, the broad goal of increasing green space or the, the outcome actually of moving spear, shifting spear, minimizing its cross section results in additional space. Um, and as I look at that through the lens of uh, parks, open space, green space, and experience, you have to do that in concert with the idea of land use and development, right? And I think even at a purely pragmatic level, just looking at it through that lens, to me, I, I wouldn't want to, if we can carve out space, I wouldn't want to take all of that space and convert it solely to green space, that front sphere, because then you don't have this nice corridor experience. You don't have the urban edge that we were asked to think about in terms of a campus setting. Um, and I think ultimately it makes the green spaces much more interesting and dynamic because you're bringing in more use, vested users. So I, I mentioned affordable housing. I think there's an opportunity for that, but think differently about what that cross section of green space looks like, because I think there are gonna be areas where you're gonna, you're gonna carve some out and the best use of what you carve out may be private development. You know, it may be institutional uses. You know, it may be a campus building. It may be housing. So that I think is as critical to Spear as it is to activating and creating a much more interesting and authentic urban green space, which is what Cherry Creek Cultural Corridor should be. You know, you you, it needs to be natural in, in terms of providing that experience, but it is still very urban. So having some development that fronts it on both sides, Spear and the Creek, I think is a, is a great opportunity. Yes, sir. No, go ahead. Good morning, uh, Joel Noble, Chair of the Denver Planning Board. Um, thank you all for the wonderful pre presentations and different facets of thoughts on this. Um, I keep coming back in my mind, Ross, to what you were talking about. I think you said it so clearly. Um, this is all downtown. This isn't one area and another area and a third area, and we're just trying to make them a little bit less bad in how they interact with each other. Uh, you said clearly it's all one downtown. And this highway condition, going through the middle of downtown is incompatible. You use the word incompatible with the urban environment. And thank you for that. I think that's, that's a vision we have to all leave with is how do we make it all one downtown and how do we take a highway condition you identified both on Spear, but also on Auraria, which we haven't given enough talk to, to talk, uh, talk about. It's uh, another highway condition. How do we make those boulevards? So the language here matters. And my question for you all is, we get the language right that puts pictures in our heads. What do you recommend as we bring the whole community forward through a many year process in terms of the role of visualizations? How much should we be leading with uh, renderings and other ways for people to uh, not just hear about what we're talking about because change is always scary, but visualize a connected downtown, a multimodal downtown, a safe downtown? Um, well, first I would say um, the whole understanding, this is always gonna be a busy corridor, Auraria and Spear together. And 
that's why we we said test a six lane section. Wouldn't it be great if four lanes work? But when you got a major interstate interchange and it's one of only four interchanges for the whole downtown, that may not be realistic. But Denver has, I think it's worth reminding people that Denver has this marvelous history of grand boulevards. And there are, they come in various varieties and they're in many different parts of the community. So the chance here is now to have, what is the downtown version of a grand boulevard? Um, I think it can become, you know, the postcard shot of Denver, you know, is from just Northwest looking over. I think this Grand Boulevard becomes the next part of that postcard shot, uh, becomes a destination almost into itself. That's a nice place to be. I want to go there. Um, and so visualization does become important. Um, but I think spend some time on the history of these things locally, all the different examples, and see what you can do. Really critical to work with the development partners at the Ball Arena site and elsewhere nearby to understand their needs and see, see what ideas they can bring to making this a better place. It'll help them and it'll, it'll help all of downtown. You know, it, it's interesting as designers, we love visualizations and we love working on them. Um, but visualiz visualizations towards an opportunity to realize them is really crucial. When we were planning the ASU downtown Phoenix campus, which was mostly surface parking lot, it was sort of like Cherry Creek. People thought it was dangerous. It wasn't dangerous. This wasn't enough going on there at moments. Really, you're going to put a campus there? There's no evidence of an educational opportunity. So it took visualizations to show it, but the target was a bond election. So the visualizations were in the service of a chance for you, the voters, to say, is that a good idea? Would my son or daughter now stay in the area and go to school and maybe even work and live here? It passed two to one in a state that ranks about 49th for K through 12 education at the moment. People want education. So the visualizations of what could be, which were on the front page of the newspaper in their schematic form and continue to be useful with the council and the mayor and others, but we could see the opportunity to turn a visualization into reality because there were going to be resources dedicated to it. If you all like this. If they're visualizations waiting for a champion, that's hard. Visualizations that a champion says, I need, I'm gonna go out there, in this case, the mayor, uh, and campaign for that, really useful. So they're useful, the context is important. So I think one of the things that's brilliant about visualizations is they're not in concrete. And they show you sometimes, oh, that isn't what I wanted. That isn't what I intended. Just for a moment, I'll reflect back to 2005 to 2008. What are we gonna do with Winthrop Street? How is it gonna look? We went over and over again. We had visualization of, after visualization after visualization, but you know what happened? It worked out. And to our surprise, the neighborhood came together and then the world started coming. And so I think that it's really important to consider them not as an, an unchangeable representation, but rather something that in this stage for certain induces another discussion and brings out more people who can say, oh, now that I saw that, maybe that's not what I want. So, uh, or maybe it actually is, but I, I think it is a tool that we can use. I don't go crazy with 3D stuff. That's, you know, but just, just those things, you can do a fly through, you can do a few things, you can walk along the street and it will tell you a lot, but it really comes back to, and as Marilee and I were talking uh, a couple of days ago, you have a way of bringing communities together in discussions that I think is really remarkable. And I think it is because you spend time listening as well as time speaking. That said, even though some of these things are far away, I think that what I would like to just underscore for maybe what might be the last comment or two here is get started. Start the test. It's not, that's not expensive. Waiting too long may be expensive. So that's my thought. Any last question, sir?
Hi, thanks. Fred Glick again. You know, as we've been sitting here talking, one of the things that I've been contemplating, and Ross, you just referred to it, is the, the historic nature of Spear Boulevard, and it's widely recognized to be part of Denver's historic parkway system, very tied into the city, beautiful history, et cetera. And while I can, in my mind, make arguments on both sides of it, I wonder if you guys, in your discussions, considered the historic preservation implications, constraints as part of this for, for what you've presented is a, is a very radical rethinking of, of that street in a lot of ways. Uh, and so that's the first part. And the follow on, I guess, is are there other instances you would point to of these roads that are in a way very much character defining or perceived as being character defining the city that have been rethought Did that make sense? Yes, um, and I, I've got a long history in historic preservation. and One always wants to be a little careful about what gets preserved. Um, because, I mean, you, you could argue, I mean, in some ways, the, the current version of Spear was bold in its own way. Unfortunately, the whole neighborhood got leveled. And then the problem was actually there was too much space. There weren't enough constraints to really focus a, um, a more precise design. But as I said, it's still an important path of green in a part of town where you don't get a lot of green. Um, and that's in part because the creek is nearby and it was a nod to the historic legacy of the parkways. Um, but I don't think preserving the actual cross section and the, the extreme width of this thing is a, a particularly worthy goal. But there is a story to be told, and this could be built into some part of the experience of being there, where there's some sort of um, pictorial or uh, set of maps that tells the story. There may be other ways to do this story, but to tell the whole history of Denver from the first people who lived at, at the, um, where the waters meet and, and how the city ultimately starts at that spot and develops and how your roads reflect that. Um, so I think that would be an interesting background to understanding, letting people understand how you get to the new, the new version. So the story I think needs to be preserved. Um, there's local landmark status for the section of Spear north of Colfax. Um, the national designation I understand is for the part south. Um, I don't wanna make light of local landmark designation but frankly, there aren't a lot of constraints about what you do next. And I think the generous public nod or the nod to a better public realm would be trying to re-embrace and reclaim the historic city beautiful efforts to get a, a boulevard that works for the 21st century. Well, and, and I'll piggyback on that with, if you look back, um, from a historical lens, not at the cross section or alignment of Spear. Why, why was it created? Why were the boulevards and parkways created? They were experiential elements. You know, they were part of the experience of the city and they were intent on conveying the aspirations of what the city wanted to become. And so I think as we think about both through the lens of respectfully, uh, you know, historic uh, um, recognition, but also is that working today? You know, if the history of Spear Boulevard was to convey something about Denver, to provide an experience that is unique, to be a gateway as experience in and of itself, is it working now? Because that's where it started. So if we're going to preserve and talk about preserving or embracing history, it needs to be in physical form and that needs to be acknowledged, but it also needs to be in intent and vision. So I think it's a balance, it's a push-pull, it's a tension between the two. So from an urban design perspective, I just have one uh, thought to add. Um, the intent of City Beautiful and also the intent of the Parkway is about creating the experience of moving along as a piece of recreation, as a piece of leisure. So if we apply that to the 21st century, how do we move? It's focusing on walking, cycling, and jogging. That's from that uh, uh, appreciation standpoint. So I think what is an uh, uh, opportunity in here is that similar to Shami Lise, it do have a very strong history but the contemporary expectation, uh, expression of that from an experience standpoint, from a user standpoint, 
can have a different legacy. Like in other words, it's not a parkway for moving vehicle. It could be your uh, 21st century urban promenade that where you want to have the parade, the festival, the zero to five weeks that we talk about in here, so that you make that into a place of destination that people will gather. So I think what we should say is uh, I, for one, and I think the panelists all are believing that maybe we have done what we wanted to do, which is to launch another conversation among you. You're very, very good at it. And I also want to recognize two young men from CU. They worked with us this week. They are entering into their final year of architecture structures. Uh, and uh, I think they represent something very interesting, which is while some people then choose after school to leave uh, and explore somewhere else, so many of the people who are in this education now stay here. And that I think is a really, really wonderful thing to keep in mind, to cherish and figure out how you can make it continue to happen. So uh, Caitlin Johnson and Riley Wines, stand up and we'd like to thank you very much. And with that, thank you all for your attention and your great comments. Thank you.